Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Kayak Fishing Weekly, the show on the Sirius Angler Podcast Network dedicated to all things kayak fishing. I'm your host, Justin Largen, and once again, I need to start the show with an apology. I missed another show last week. I said I wouldn't, and I did. Um, I was actually traveling for the KBF National Championship. I did not have a great practice. I did not expect to have a really good event, so I was kind of thinking that after day one of the competition, uh, we'd put together a little show. Uh, and I actually did better than I thought. So the, the show kind of got postponed. So apologies for that. Uh, but for anyone that was listening last week, and you know, if you listened all the way to the very end, I mentioned that I was thinking about doing a new segment. You know, I've, I've been sort of brainstorming, trying to come up with a way to reach a broader audience. Uh, I'm you know, kind of a, I guess, a fishing nerd uh, to the highest level. It's like I love the, the competitions, the tournament strategy, um, hearing the, the thought process of the different guys that do well in tournaments. I love talking about that stuff, hearing about that stuff. I realize not everybody is into it quite to the same degree. Uh, there's lots of guys out there that just love to fish. Uh, and, and that's me, too. Uh, but I, I want to appeal to to more of sort of the, the average guys. I want the show to have something for everybody. So a segment that I want to add to the future episodes is kind of a tip segment. Uh, and I think we're going to be leaning towards sort of money saving tips, like kayaking on a budget, that sort of thing. Um, and I actually had someone reach out to me last week and he's going to be our guest this week. Uh, spoiler. But he, he reached out with an idea um, to talk, you know, kind of dedicate a whole show to that topic, sort of a, a budget friendly, how to get into kayaking, um, on a budget. You know, when I first started, that's kind of what I did. You know, the reason, one of the big reasons I got into kayaking was because bass boats, even 15 years ago, were really expensive. They're still really expensive. And a kayak, uh, I could get a, a fairly nice kayak. Uh, you know, not the top of the line, but I could get a, a more than serviceable kayak for a little over a thousand dollars. And that is still the case today. Uh, now, in the years since, um, some expensive gear, some you know, higher higher end kayak. Um, you know, I've spent plenty of money at, in this sport, uh, but you don't have to. Um, you can definitely get out there, catch fish, and even compete on a budget. So that's going to be the focus of the show tonight. Uh, but before I introduce my guest, before we jump into that topic, we've got some news. So I mentioned the KBF National Championship. I guess we can start there. Um, it was April 3rd, 4th, and 5th. I like how they do it during the week. Uh, it was on Lake Gunnersville in, uh, in Alabama, one of the most pressured lakes in the country. So having it midweek is nice. There was a little bit less traffic uh, than on the weekend. You know, weekends down there can, can get crazy, especially this time of the year. There's big fish to be caught. Everybody knows it. You've got recreational anglers, guides. Uh, weekend tournaments, you know, tournaments like ours, uh, it can get very crowded. So uh, that was a fun tournament. You know, I love fishing grass lakes personally. And and it was, uh, well, I'll put it this way. Anybody who, who thought that Wyatt Hammond winning that trail series event last year, uh, or I guess technically it was a trail series championship on Gunnersville, thinking that that was a fluke, no, 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 no. Wyatt uh, won again. Uh, first KBF championship winner to hail from the state of North Carolina. Uh, and he put on a very impressive display. Uh, I believe it was 95. I think his first two days, uh, his limits were over 95 inches. He put up just under 90 on day three, a three day total of 276 and a quarter inches uh, to win very comfortably by a five inch margin. Congrats to Mr. Wyatt Hammond. I hope to talk to him in the not too distant future about that. Uh, fantastic angler, uh, made a very good showing for himself. Uh, and again, for anybody who who you know wasn't paying attention last year, he was actually the KBF Angler of the Year, and he was the Rookie of the Year. Uh, second place for the championship was Mr. Mike Elsey. Uh, he he made a run at becoming the first ever KBF two-time national champion. And got close. He stumbled a little bit the second day, but put up massive limits on day one and day three. Uh, three day total, 
271 inches. Uh, very impressive showing mm -hmm. by Mr. Elsie. And then third place, the kayak fishing goat, Russ Snyder's uh, Chad, you know, let everybody know before the tournament, Russ was a little under the weather so that guys wouldn't be over there blocking him. You know, nobody asking for autographs or anything like that. Uh, so Russ was, I'm not sure exactly what he was battling, but he was a little bit under the weather and it did not show at all in his fishing. Put up a three-day total of 265 and a half inches, good enough for third place. And uh, I don't think anybody was surprised. So that was the KBF National Championship. Uh, KBF also had a trail event. I'll, uh, I'll Maybe I'll talk about that one on a future event. Um, but I want to jump into the, the Hobie BOS that was happening simultaneously April 6th and 7th this past weekend. Um, Lake Norman. And, you know, I've... I remember reading articles in Bassmaster years ago about how Lake Norman was a tough fishery, lots of small fish, um, just just not, you know, it, it was known as a, a numbers lake, not a place where you can catch quality. Uh, but it was very impressive. I was looking at the stats. Um, 18 anglers out of that, I believe it was a little over 100 uh, that actually competed, and 18 of those anglers had 170 inches or more. So that's an 85-inch average. For the top 18 anglers that's pretty impressive for any lake so lake norman really showed out i was scrolling through the pictures there were a lot of big spotted bass that got caught as well as some big largemouth um, so impressive uh impressive fishery um i was a little bit surprised but uh i was not surprised by the champion mr lowell brandon uh put up 182 inches to win again a pretty comfortable margin of victory four inches uh, Two-day total, 182 inches. Congrats to him. Uh, for anyone that missed it last year, he won the Bassmaster event on Lake Hartwell. So that is a name to watch anytime you're fishing in the Carolinas. Uh, Lowell Brandon is the hammer down there. Uh, second place, Mr. John House, 178 inches, another great showing. And then third place, Bennett Nall, 177 and a half inches. So uh, and, and the field was very tight uh, through that that top 15. Again, 18 anglers with 170 inches or more. Uh, that is impressive. Uh, very, very impressive. So that is, I guess, a recap of the tournaments that have already happened. And we have a Bassmaster. We talked about two in the three trail series. Now we'll talk about Bassmaster. Uh, a lot of friends I have uh, down at Possum Kingdom this week getting ready. Uh, I believe Friday will be their last day of practice, and then they will compete Saturday and Sunday uh, down on Possum Kingdom. That place has developed a reputation, at least in the kayaking world, as a land of the giants. I saw some big fish being posted already this week. That should be a slugfest. Um, I'm, I'm a little sad that I can't be down there, uh, but you know, you got to pick and choose. Uh, it made sense for me to fish the championship. I'm glad I did, uh, but at the same time, I hate that I can't be down there. I have a feeling there's going to be some bedding fish caught. I love to bed fish, and knowing that you got the possibility of, you know, cruising past a 10-pounder on a bed, um, that's something I would love to. Uh, I, I guess you could say that's a, a lifetime achievement goal for me is catch a 10-pounder off a bed, and I will not be surprised if someone or multiple people do that this coming weekend. So I'm going to be glued to the uh, the phone, or at least sneaking the phone out as often as I can at work the, this uh, this coming weekend to tune in and see how the guys are doing down there. So that I think wraps up the news segment. So we, uh, yeah, I guess it's time to jump right into our main event. Again, we're going to be talking about uh, budget kayak fishing how to get out there and compete uh, without breaking the bank. Kayak fishing on a budget. Once again, that's going to be our topic tonight. And our guest is uh, an anchor that I think I'm looking forward to talking to. Uh, we, we spoke a little bit kind of preparing for the show yesterday. And he's he's kind of, I don't want to call him a newcomer to the sport. He's He's accomplished a fair bit already. Uh, but I guess compared to me, we'll say a relative newcomer, uh, kind of a hunting background, grew up fishing. I won't spoil too much of his uh, 
his his backstory because I want to I want him to go into detail about that. Uh, but he's you know fairly recently gotten that kayak fishing bug, um, and I want to talk a little bit about sort of his his transition, how he started, uh, and kind of how he's evolved over the couple of years that he's been doing it. Uh, he has some really neat ideas, I think, for for how to kayak fish on a budget. So without further ado, we're going to welcome to Kayak Fishing Weekly, Mr. Brandon Yoder. Brandon, thank you for joining me. Awesome. Glad to be here. So Brandon, we, we kind of always like to ask someone you know who's coming onto the show for the first time about the backstory kind of how they how they got their start um and then even more specifically like kind of how you got in the kayaking world yeah so i um i mean at a young age i was fishing like i don't remember like the first person that took me fishing it was either my dad or my uncle and grew up in a neighborhood we had a, two small ponds in the neighborhood and just when i got into it i was really into it and um so probably if i had to guess you know like 12 years old, 10, 12 years old is when I, you know, started casting a line out, just catching bluegill. We had a, yeah, bluegill, of course, because that's what everyone starts with. And we had this pond that had these bluegill in it. And uh, I think the biggest one I caught out of there was an 11 inch bluegill. Um, and I, I, since then, I've always said pound for pound, I think bluegill are the strongest fighters. Like if you could have a 19 inch bluegill, it would fight harder than a bass. Um, but it's funny because even when I was, learning how to fish i was already fishing on a budget uh and what i mean by that is like i would i would cast into a tree and lose a bobber or whatever and uh you know i was a kid i didn't have money and we weren't going to be running to walmart but i still wanted to fish so i would find a stick you know like the size of your finger and just tie a knot around the stick and get right back to fishing with like a stick for a bobber to catch these <laughs> <laughs> to catch these bluegill and uh so you know even at that at a young age i was already you know finding ways to save money and still enjoy the sport. Um, as I got a little older, I got more into bass fishing. And uh, I remember like just beating the banks of a local lake. Uh, my mom would drive me out there and I'd beat the banks on this local lake for hours, um, catching bass and learning how to fish. And then as I got a little older, I got more into hunting. I still fit, would fish some, but I kind of got more into the hunting stuff. Um, took a couple of nice bucks and just had it nice. I, I we. When I was 16, we moved to kind of what we called the family farm. And I didn't realize how nice I had it because I could just jump on the four wheeler and like run back to the woods and hunt whenever I wanted to. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but then, so we moved there when I was 16 and then um, got into, like I said, more into hunting, still did some fishing. But then when I was, I think, 23 or 24, I cut out on my own and moved up to Pennsylvania. And that's where I live today. Um, and uh, I was for, I don't know, six, seven years. I didn't do anything with the outdoors. Like I kind of knew when I moved to Pennsylvania, I just wasn't going to have that stuff as readily available. And I got into the salt, like the men's softball league scene, um, like doing even like, you know, like tournaments and state level stuff. And just kind of, that was kind of my hobby, my outdoor fix. Nice. Uh, but then in 2020, I was like, man, I have got to, you know, everyone just needed to get outside and just do something again. And I kind of was the same way. And so in 2020, I, I was like, man, I just got to get outside again. I got to get outdoors and I got to do something. And I was like, well, the easiest thing, the most accessible thing for where I live is to go fishing again. So I still had my old rod and reel back from my teenage years and tackle box with, you know, a little bit of tackle and it probably a couple prank baits and some old Sankos and some hooks and stuff. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to go fishing again. And I, I started fishing that summer or like probably that spring and just fell in love with it all over again. And it was a little bit later that year. I, um, I, I had a buddy that was in a little, somewhat into kayaking would do some tournaments and uh, I kind of started learning about kayaks and like, not even that there was like this whole kayak tournament scene and like, national tournaments or anything like that and uh, but I was like hey like okay kayaks are a thing and they're a way that I can actually get like away from the bank and get out on the water and yes catch some of these fish that I can't access with the lakes that I was fishing where you can either fish you know close to the docks where everyone is or this other lake you know you can work your way around it 
you were in the woods half the time and there were a couple access points where you could get out to the water. And I was like, hey, kayak's gonna get me out on the water and gonna let me, you know, access some areas that I previously couldn't access. Now you're hitting a lot of rivers in Pennsylvania or, so, or is it a mix? At that time, I didn't even know that Pennsylvania had smallmouth. <laughs> like okay. I grew up, where I grew up in Maryland, we didn't have smallmouth. We had large mouth and we had lakes with large mouth and some of the creeks had large mouth and pick and like chain pickerel and, you know, bluegill obviously and stuff like that. I gotcha. didn't even know, like, I mean, I was so green with, with, fishing in this area that I didn't even know we had smallmouth, much less did I know what the Susquehanna was and what it had. Um, I'm about 40 minutes to the Susquehanna and I had no clue. At that time it was, I lived even closer. Um, and so I was, I was just largemouth fishing again from the bank. Um, and uh, so then the, the, you know what, I think it was when I was still bank fishing, I, I found out, hey, Pennsylvania has smallmouth. I was like, that's cool. I've never caught a smallmouth before. And so I do lawn care. And I one of my clients is a school and there's a creek that runs through the school. And I think one of the custodians or someone told me, hey, yeah, there's actually smallmouth in that creek. And I was like, oh, cool. And they gave me permission to fish it. So like sometimes in the evenings, I'd be done mowing and I'd grab my rod and reel and just run over to the creek. And that's where I caught my first smallmouth I've ever caught. I think it was like eight inches or 10 inches or something, but I was like, cool. This is nice. my first small mouth I've ever caught. Um, so yeah, Pennsylvania actually has a great mix of large mouth, small mouth fishing, creeks, lakes, reservoir, you know, um, a lot of our lakes are actually like man. I don't want to say man-made reservoirs in the sense that they're completely man-made. Usually they were a stream or a creek that got dammed up and created a, you know, a reservoir. Um, sure. They're not necessarily all natural. Or I would almost say most of them aren't natural lakes. Um, but we do have a great combination of, of largemouth and smallmouth fishing. That's awesome. Now, walk me through, I guess, your your first kayak. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear because that's one of the things that, that I kind of want to touch on. I want to go over a little bit of gear uh, and kind of stuff that, you know, I want to get kind of your opinion and then and I guess see if see how similar mine is to uh, – to different gear because because you know you, you could talk theoretically about different stuff um uh, like my first first kayak ever uh, i was in a little bit different situation i was probably around the same age as you um but i was in i was living in dc and you know, i didn't really have it was apartments uh, technically i was living in virginia working in dc but um there wasn't really space for a big bass boat i couldn't afford a big bass boat so you know kayak was perfect i could get in these little small reservoirs I could get out of the Potomac, the tidal part of that. Um, so, you know, kayaking was perfect. My first one was a Wilderness Systems Commander, which was kind of a canoe kayak hybrid that they discontinued a number of years ago. Uh, and then I ended up you know, graduating from that to a ride. I think it was called a ride uh, 115, like 11 and a half footer, sit on top. Kind of a, for me, a perfect all around kayak. Um, but I'm I'm curious to hear about hear about your your first kayak. So again, being completely green to the kayaks, and I think even when I bought that first kayak, I, I didn't even know what the kayak scene was. I'm just trying to get away from the bank and just do some better fishing than what I was accessing at the, at that time. So I was like, I, I wanted something cheap, but I wanted something that get me on the water, and I had I knew like the was it tractor supply? They had like some Pelican kayaks and they were kind of like, I think they had, mold, you know, like the molded seats to sit on top where they were sit ins. And so I started thinking when I first started thinking about a kayak, I was like, you know, if I can find something for $300 that I can just paddle around and catch some fish out of, well, then the more you look into these kayaks, the it's almost like you, you see the next tier and then you see the next tier and, you know, you, you go all the way up to getting a, you know, a PA 14 Hobie or something. Um, but I was trying to keep it cheap. I, I was just trying to get out on the water. And then I found the Ascends um, from like the Ascend brand from, from Bass Pro. And it has the look of like one of the, one, a better kayak than what it is, I guess you could say, because it's, it's thin plastic and they're not extremely stable, but it has that look of like the competitive kayak or competitive kayak market, you know, produces. And, uh, 
So I was, I, I found an Ascend 10T, I think it was on sale, the Bass Pro Shops was running some kind of sale. And so I bought it, got it, I think I got it around June, July, something like that, was able to get out on the water with it. And then that changed everything. Um, and I took that 10T, I took that thing everywhere. We took, I took it up to the Juniana, which is the main tributary of the Susquehanna. And there's rapids there. I mean, like, it's not crazy rapids, but there's, there's, a couple decent drops that when you're in a, a flimsy kayak is a little bit uh you know. oh it's sketchy yeah a little sketchy <laughs> I, I knew there was one time I, I filled the kayak up with water coming over one of those rapids and it was everything i could do to keep from flipping it and get over to the bank and drain the water out and then get back to fishing and Did that, not that have scuppers uh it had scuppers but i mean i was at or over the weight limit so it had oh that's the thing so it had scuppers but I mean, the 10T is, is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a sketchy kayak to begin with. I gotcha. had to keep, I had to keep plugs in it to keep water from coming in. Gotcha. <laughs> so the scuppers okay. were not going to drain. They, they were not, they were more, they would fill up the kayak instead of draining out the kayak. You, you take the scuppers out, more water comes in. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, and but then it, I, I took that thing also, I, I had that 10T on the, um, the Northeast River, which is part of the uh, Upper Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. I, I had that thing out on the Upper Chesapeake. <laughs> nice. Um, and caught, you know, caught a nice fish out there. It was, it was a tough day. I, and I'm so green on tidal waters, but it was a tough day and caught, it was probably close to a five pounder out there. So that, you know, that made it all worth it. Well, that'll make um, a day, yeah. Yeah. And so then with having that kayak, then I started to be, okay, I want something where I could stand and fish and, you know, the progression, you know, you start out here and you, you keep going on up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the next, I started looking at something that would be a little bit more stable, a little bit more, you know, maybe be able to stand on it. And I found an, uh, what was the Ascend 128T. So still in that Ascend line, still in that uh, cheaply made, you know, Ascend line. And I don't want to say cheaply made as though that that is something that you you know, that ascend line is something you should steer away from. It's, they're just, they're mass produced and they're, they're made with thinner plastic and they're, and they're made to sell at a cheaper price than everything else on the market. Mm -hmm. And that's how Bass Pro moves so many of them. And so that's fine. And, and, and they move a lot of them. It's a good point. They, uh, from my understanding that, that ascend model, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's which specific one or if it's just the entire line that they count, but those ascends are some of the best selling kayaks that are out there specifically because you get them at Bass Pro Shops. It's it's the mega store for bass fishing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people like you, you know, if you're at Bass Pro Shops, you're thinking about kayaking, that's what you got. And and it's still it it's fairly, I mean, I don't remember the exact price, but it's it's in that thousand dollar price range, isn't it? The ascends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or I mean, is it the, under? It's under. I think the the 10T is like it re and they, they run sales on that stuff all the time. I mean, you can get the 10T brand new for like maybe 600 or even under. And okay. then they don't make the 128T anymore. They make a 128X and a 133X. And those are both around $1,000, you know, okay. give or take a little bit, but they're right around there. They also make a 12T, which is kind of the in-between of the 10T and the and the 128 Um I don't know if that one functions a little bit more stably like the 128 or if it functions more like the 10 and is because it's longer, it might be a little faster or better tracking. I don't know. I've heard people, you know, people that have the 12 T actually really like it. Um, okay. But I don't know if it's how stable that one actually is. Um, so gotcha. With the with so I, I found I found a 128T on Facebook Marketplace. Then so I'm I'm running the 10T. I found a 128T on Facebook Marketplace, and I was like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. And I was actually able to sell my 10T for right around maybe even more than I bought it for because I got it on a sale, and then I paid less for the 128T than what I sold my 10T for. <laughs> you made a profit and yeah. upgrade. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good lesson out there. Um, and, and believe it or not, uh, I think post COVID, uh, I think there were a lot of people that, that got into the sport during that time. So if you if you're somebody who's new to the sport, you're looking to get your first kayak, it's a good time to do it. You can mm -hmm. find deals on Facebook Marketplace. There's a lot of people that 
you know, tried it for whatever reason, didn't like it, uh, or maybe never even tried it. Uh, I've, I've seen kayaks on Facebook Marketplace never used. You know, it's, it's you know, junking up somebody's garage or their front yard or whatever. And now they're trying to sell them. Um, you know, the, the, the secondhand market is there's a lot of boats out there right now. So that's a, a good tip uh, for, you know, don't be afraid to buy secondhand. You can get a lot of stuff that's brand new, used once for significantly cheaper than it will cost you, you know, to get it off the, the factory floor. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And I think we're going to we're going to touch on that a little at some point, too, about that Facebook marketplace, use kayaks and what to look for and, and all that. We'll, we'll certainly get to that. Um so that 128T that I had, I, I, and that thing is, if anyone ever has one of those, if, if, if you're running one of those or you're considering one of those, it is, it is fairly stable. I was able to stand and fish in it. Um, it's not super stable. You can definitely flip it when you're standing up. And I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm, uh, I'm six foot and I'm 260 ish somewhere in there. And so like, the, you know, if you're, if you're 5'10 and 180, like it's probably going to be more stable for you. Um, but for me, it was like, yeah, I can do it, but you were always a little shaky doing it. Um, hmm. and I, and I never, I mean, I did, but I, I wouldn't make a habit on that one of standing up in current, especially just cause a little whip and you're going to probably go on into the water. Um, so, but, and that thing's a barge and I paddled that thing for about a year and a half. Um, I think it was. Hmm. Either a half year, or a year and a half. I actually can't remember how long I battled, but I, I I put I put a lot of paddle miles on that kayak, and um, I could do the math real quick, but let's not take time for that. <laughs> anyway, so I, I I paddled that thing a lot, and then at the end of the year twenty, I think it was end of twenty twenty one. So it was probably just a half year with it. I think I'm, I think I'm saying that right. The end of 2021, I so on the off season then, I figured, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out a way to rig a motor up on this thing so I don't have to paddle it anymore. And I was like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it the most like DIY yet like convenient professional build I could do. And so I actually, I, I didn't just stick a, you know, a trolling motor on it and, you know, just use, you know, use my hand to, to, to steer it on the tiller or put an extension on the tiller. I actually, I, I made everything or it was, for, I either fabricated it myself or I made, or I used hardware store stuff in order to do the whole build. And so I had, I had, I took the trolling motor and I, I lobbed the, the head off of it. There it is. I lobbed the go. head off of it and mounted the head up by the seat, ran the wires back through the hole, um, made my own mounting plate and my own mounting surface, and uh, was able to mount that trolling motor to the kayak. Put, uh, if we go back to that one, the picture of the motor itself. Let's see. There we go, that, that, one, that one. one right there, that one right there. So I, I made that bracket out of PVC. And I actually, when I was doing the research on it, I realized that if you run your PVC on an angle, like actual wings, you can get a tighter steering, uh, like uh, radius. I think I'm saying the right word there. You can get a tighter steering radius by angling the pe by angling the arms. So I did that. Um, I, I figured out a way to like fuse it all into the uh, into the uh, shaft of the trolling motor. Ran my wires out of the top ran eye bolts on it and ropes on it so that I could actually lift it out of the water when I was in shallow water. Uh, my, my steering cables are close, are um, like clothesline cable. Um, <laughs> it's all outfitted with eye bolts. So that way I can make adjustments in case, you know, the cables would stretch a little bit, or I want it to, you know, bring the steering, the foot pedals back to me a little bit, you know, or make some adjustments. I, I, I left room for all those adjustments. Um, I used, I was smart enough to use stable or stainless steel on pretty much everything I did because I didn't want things rusting out, having to replace things. Smart. Um, if we can, if you can go to the picture of running things up the side, of kind of where everything runs up the side, right there, that'll work. Nope, right the there. previous so, one. Yep. No, that one works great. So okay. I didn't. 
I didn't, I wanted to run things through the hall, but I really didn't know if I could figure out a way to do that in a way that wasn't, or in, in an efficient way. So I just ran everything on the top side through eye bolts um, up to the foot, up to the foot controls. And I didn't buy any of the foot control kits. I just simply took the stops out of the, um, the footrests and uh, that allowed them to slide in the bracket. Um, and then I would keep in the kayak, I would keep some like silicone spray, like uh, I think it was WD-40, but it was like silicone instead of the oil. And okay. every once in a while, I would just spray that either on the cables or on the foot controls and it would keep everything, you know, working pretty well as far as from getting from anything getting too tight um on the on the steering or from grabbing that it would allow it to kind of slide and keep it lubricated gotcha that is um i am not that hands-on um i think that the most complicated thing i've done with the kayak you know I've, I've drilled some holes i've i think my one of my my first kayaks i put the flush mounts in um you know that that what i thought i thought wow look look at me uh all handsy but um, and then I ran foot steering, um, mm -hmm. but I have not done anything that is that intricate, uh, like <laughs> your design there. That is, uh, I, I imagine that the, oh, wrong thing. I imagine that it is, it was significantly cheaper to, to go that route. Um, like what, what do you think you had invested in, in the parts, uh, to, to put that together? You know, like say compared to a, a Newport or a Torquedo. Um, man, I don't know. Um, the, I, so a Minn Kota trolling motor is one hundred and thirty dollars. A, a thirty pound thrust Minn Kota, uh, the Endura C two thirty, whatever that thing is, it's like one hundred and thirty dollars. Um, okay. The and I, I used a lithium battery, uh, Life Pu four, I guess you call them battery, in order to keep the weight down. But I got that from Amazon. Um, at that time, those batteries were selling for like, I think probably about double the cost of what they are now. I actually looked up that same battery that I was using on on that kayak. It was a, had a different name at that time. They've been rebranded. But the, if you go on Amazon, they're Lie Time. Uh, it's called Li Time. So Li Time uh, batteries. And the 50, 12 volt, 50 amp hour battery sells for $180. Which that is. is <laughs> if you're the same price yes it is now one thing people will tell you with the with those amazon batteries oh their warranty and everything like that i can't speak for all of the amazon batteries but on that line time battery i actually you i had to use the warranty on one that i had um the first one that i had the first battery i had to use the warranty on it and it was a little complicated a little cumbersome to work through their warranty system like they wanted pictures and they wanted some some information and everything and it was a little bit of back and forth, but I got a new bat. I got a warranty battery that worked great for as long as I had that kayak yet. Um, and my experience with our warranty was was really great. Like I had no issues with it really, other than it being a little cumbersome. Um, it definitely is not a no questions asked warranty, but if you work with them and they'll, it seems like they'll work with you. Um, and that, like I said, that battery right now sells for $180 on Amazon. Um, hmm. and, uh, so I had that, so right there, and I think when I bought that battery, it was like 280 or $300 somewhere. It was more expensive. Like I said, maybe close to almost double the price, um, than what they are now. So right there, my motor and my, my, my battery and my motor, maybe $400 in that hardware store parts, maybe another hundred, maybe another 150, something like that. And I got that kayak for $550. So I had a motorized kayak for probably under twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, that's what my math is saying. <laughs> twelve hundred dollars motorized, and that's that that's crazy. Uh, I mean, you spend more than that on a, a torpedo, and I'm not yeah. knocking torpedo. Uh, I mean, the Newports are are close to that. I think they're a little under that twelve hundred, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're they're both great products. Yeah, but but that's I, impressive to be able to basically just you know do the work yourself yeah. find the find the the you know, find the parts put that knowledge together and and build it yourself that is really cool <laughs> and i 
Um, I don't have that kayak anymore. I sold that one. And now that I'm more into the tournaments, I have, I now have a Jackson Cusa X with the NK, Newport NK 180. Um, we can talk about that at some point too, um, because even that one was built on using kind of a budget basis and finding deals and um, buying things on Black Friday sales using clearance codes or not clearance codes, but um, like discount codes. Um, in order to keep my price down on that on that new build, um, but I am I I am not in that ascend anymore. That was last year's kayak. I now have the the Jackson Cusa X, which is I absolutely love it. But again, yeah. I, everything I did with this kayak, or pretty much everything, I still approached from trying to get the absolute best price that I could. This kayak right here. So this 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 would be a tip I would give if if somebody wants a good kayak, um, but they're trying to keep the price down. You can buy a used kayak. Um, sometimes the thing about buying a used kayak on Facebook Marketplace is when you buy an, you know, you're not when you buy a used kayak, you won't always get the warranty with it. Um, some companies, I think, they're transferable warranties. Some warranties are only for the original purchaser. But that kayak I bought as a demo model uh, from Delaware Paddle Sports, and. I, because I bought it as a demo model, like it was used a little bit, but it wasn't like a used kayak that you buy from somebody else. So I still had the warranty on it because I've still bought it from the dealer and I got it at probably 40, 45% off of what the retail is, something like that. Like they had it listed. It was listed for a while. And then I um, bargained with them a little bit and got them down even a little bit more. And uh, awesome. I think I had I think I got that thing at around 40 some percent off or something. I, I should do the math on that because I could be wrong. Um, but now that that, well, I, that is a good tip. I know along the same lines, you've got you've got companies that are coming out with a new line or maybe they're discontinuing a color. Um, and I know there's a lot of kayaks on the market right now, different places that basically the, the kayak's brand new. It's it's maybe it's a two year old model or three year old model. Um, you know, these companies have come out with a new model and stores are looking to to move these older models so you can get them for a really good price. They've never mm -hmm. even hit the water. Um, I, I like your demo point. Now, have you ever tried getting one from a uh, what do they call them? Like a, a kayak rental service uh, like like a, we've got a couple of places the, where you can you can rent canoes or kayaks to float the, the local rivers. And I've, I've seen those that they're a little worn, uh, but they sell those models. You know, they've been, they've been used for a year or two, uh, you know, got some scratches, got some use, but they're, the, the prices are, uh, are, are very nice mm -hmm. uh, compared to buying something brand new. Yeah. I haven't seen that, but I would imagine it's kind of like buying a demo model where you're going to, they just want to, they want to make something for it. And most of those places probably get a good deal on their, you know, places that do, you know, kayak adventures type stuff where they're renting out kayaks. They probably get a good deal. And then when they want to buy their new models, they they just want to get something out of them. Maybe what they originally put into them, probably even less. And they just want to move them along and get, get the next kayaks. Uh, and so if you're willing to wait a little bit and keep your eyes, you know, open and keep checking around, you can find those deals. I would even say, you know, Call a couple kayak dealers, uh, dealers in your area, and just say, "Hey, I am trying to buy, you know, buy a kayak. I want something good, but I just don't have the money to to pay full price or whatever. Do you have demo kayaks, or are you going to be selling demo kayaks at any point? I'd be interested in buying. What you're going to find is most dealers they want to sell their demo kayaks. Like they don't want to have those things keep taking space when they get their next next set." Of, of demos in they they want to move those along the other thing you're going to be doing is you're going to still be supporting a local dealer you're still going to be supporting a small business i am not against buying off a of facebook marketplace however i have heard i think jeff little had put this out um maybe about a month or two ago that when you buy used you're kind of hurting your local dealer because no one's making any retail anymore off that used kayak and it's like, I get the point. And at the same time, we're all out here. All of us are trying to save money. <laughs> so I, sure. I, I have. It's definitely a catch 22. He, he, he makes a fair point. Um, and um, I think it is a fair, it is a definitely a fair point. But if, 
in my opinion, here's what I saw. When I bought that demo kayak, I got it cheaper than what I saw somebody else selling the same used kayak on Facebook Marketplace by buying a demo. So you might even get one cheaper by buying by the deal from the dealership on a demo model. Plus, you're going to get a full warranty on it. And you're going to get one that's probably less used than Joe Schmo, who's selling his used kayak on Facebook Marketplace or on Craigslist. So if you can sell awesome. a physical dealer, definitely do it because you could end up with the same price plus some perks, like I said, warranties, getting to know your local dealerships who can in turn help you out late, you know, on down the road. Perfect. I like it. So I don't know, is now a good time? Well, you mentioned your uh, your your Jackson. Is that something that I, I guess? How do you like it so far? And is that one that you would recommend to somebody who's who's looking for an affordable kayak, provided they can go through a similar route and get it get it discounted? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, that so it is a river kayak. So it has it. It's if you're familiar with the, the underside of kayaks look like a lot of the a lot of the um like um competition level kayaks they're a pontoon style kayak meaning that they have like the the um the two sides are are or the each side kind of has its own separate pontoon with a elevated center and on the on the on the bottom of the kayak and that's what gives a kayak its initial stability um when you're standing up on it or when you kind of lean to the side that that kayak feels like rock solid the Kusa X is not like that. The Kusa X actually has a very rounded bottom. So what that means is that you can navigate um, rivers and currents very well with it, but it doesn't have that initial stability. It does have secondary stability, and we'll talk about that, but it doesn't have the initial stability. So when I first got in it, there were a couple of times where I like kind of shook from side to side, and it was almost like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But I kind of I felt it out, and I was like, I, I know that once I get comfortable in this, I'm not – like I won't have to worry about that feeling anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you can get in a kayak before you purchase it, definitely do because for some people that might be a no go. That they they want that initial stability. Now, what the Coos X has that it with 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 that style of uh, of haul on it is that you could tip that thing all the way to the side to where you're letting water in, and it's not suddenly just going to flop over. Like most of these kayaks that have the pontoon style, if you like, you're going to be rock solid here. And then if you tip it, it's going to get to a point where suddenly it just flips over. The Kusa X, you can just kind of tip, 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 tip. And it's not just going to suddenly just flip over. Like I, I've, I've stood it and rocked it side to side. And I got it to the point where I almost was letting in water. And it still wasn't just like suddenly flipping over. Gotcha. It's got um, good secondary stability. Yeah. Yeah. It I think that's true of a lot of those river kayaks. The the design, like you mentioned, maybe the, the primary stability isn't quite the same, but the secondary stability, uh, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, and that's what I wanted because I got more and more into fishing the rivers around here. And I was like, I think I want a kayak that's kind of built for that and yet has good stability on, on a lake as well, if I want to take it out on a lake. Um, so I'd say, you know, find out what you like um, as far as that stability goes. If you can, you know, a lot of dealerships do demo days and that's where these demo kayaks come from. If you can get to one of those demo days and get in a couple different kayaks, even if you're not going to buy from them or if you're going to wait until those demo models go on sale, you can at least start to figure out what it is you like um, in yeah. a kayak and what it is you're looking for. I definitely agree. Yeah. Demo if you can. Um you know, even even a discounted kayak is still a pretty significant purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're talking. I feel like you got to get fairly close to that thousand dollar price point, at least uh, as far as what the retail cost would be. You know, at, at full cost uh, before you get in something that's that's really stable. That's going to be happy. That's kind of you know, I've, I'm working uh, in a, a shop now, and, and that's kind of my recommendation to people that are. That are first starting out is, you know, I'm not necessarily going to point you. I I love my Hobie, yeah. You know, old towns are good. There's a bunch of great stable boats uh, that are on the more expensive side. You know, I'm not going to recommend that to somebody who's just starting out. Um, you know, it, it's it's just you know, especially if you don't you don't know if it's something that you want to continue doing. 
but I do recommend that you know you kind of get close to that thousand dollar price range. Uh, for that, you're going to get something that's that's quality that you can build on, like mm -hmm. as you grow into the sport. You know, you can you can paddle it around initially, decide, hey, yeah, I, I do like this. You know, maybe maybe in six months, a year, two years, you decide to put a motor on the back of it uh, or add different accessories like uh, that. Having that platform to sort of build on, I think, is is important. And there's a lot of good good kayaks out there that sort of fit that bill right around a thousand dollars. Maybe you don't have all the bells and whistles, um, but, you know, Yak Attack, they make a lot of good stuff. For, for adding and sort of building your own uh, your, yeah. your your ultimate fishing machine yeah uh, as you grow into it yeah let's, let's talk about that a little bit so if if you're if, if you're on an extreme budget and you need to keep your price for your kayak at say five hundred dollars you don't have many options like you could do maybe a perception or you could do an ascend like I did for my for my first kayaks but you don't have a ton of options. You're going to need to do your research and find, you know, the kayaks that you're seeing in your area on probably Facebook Marketplace or on Craigslist. You're going to need to do your research on what does this kayak have? What are people saying about it? Are they saying it's somewhat stable? All that stuff, you know, like, or does it have, does it tend to crack in this area? Or is it, is it a good, you know, a, a well-made kayak, even if it is cheaper? You're going to need to do that that research and find out about that because you don't have a lot of options for a a fishing kayak in the 500 to 600 dollar range you're either at an ascend or a a, a perception um mate you know sun dolphin but now we're almost into the point of recreational kayaks not fishing kayaks so i think in this case we are talking strictly fishing kayaks mm -hmm. um but if you're willing to get go you know save up a little longer or wait a little bit longer and wait until you can get more in that 700 to a thousand dollar range there are some good kayaks in that range mostly used but there's some great kayaks in that range and i i would recommend if if you're if you're gonna go okay if i want well, let's do this so when we're talking about budgets um budget fishing whether it's the kayak or your gear we're talking good gear or serviceable gear at a great price you're not going to get great gear at a great price price and be in a budget range most of the time right you're going to find deals here and there but you're not for the most part you're not going to find that but you are going to get good to serviceable gear at a great price um the one kayak that i would recommend if you can get into that 700 to a thousand dollar range and you're not going to find many at 700 dollars, you might see one a year that pops up but you will find a lot between 900 to 1200 dollars. and on facebook marketplace if something's been at 1200 dollars for 30 days or whatever, you can probably chew them down to a thousand dollars. And the one kayak I would recommend at that is the Old Town Topwater 120 or the Old Town Sportsman 120. They're the same kayak, Old Town just rebranded that line. Um, it, and I'm talking the non-PDL version, not the PDL version that's gonna be 1800 to $2,200 uh, for a used one. But that Topwater, I call it Topwater 120. It is now the Sportsman 120. They're, um, but top water is what it was for years. Gotcha. I've been in it. My, uh, I had my dad buy one because my dad's starting to get into kayak fishing. I don't know that he'll ever get into the competitive stuff, but it's a great way. We've been figuring out ways to spend time together. And he got a top water from one of my buddies who just wasn't using it enough, which is the story of a lot of these kayaks on Facebook Marketplace. And he got that thing, I think, for $750, $700, something like that. We're now going to be putting a motor on that. I think actually in like a week and a half, we're going to throw a mo an NK180 on it, put the innovative sportsman uh, foot control steering on it. I'm going to be going down to Maryland where my parents live and helping him build this thing up. And he's going to get that. He's going to get a motorized old town kayak with an NK180, which he bought the, the motor and the battery on a Black Friday sale. I don't know what exactly he's going to have in that build, but if I had to guess, it's going to be less than two grand for an old for a motorized old town kayak. He's going to be at less than two thousand dollars. That's awesome. Um, and that top water one twenty is an excellent kayak. It's fast paddling. If you're going to have, if you do want to, if you're going to paddle it because you don't have a motor, it's fast. It's nimble. Um, you can get it turned quickly. And I'm going to say on paddling, you 
without having to put like crazy miles, like, yeah, you're going to have to be paddling fast, but I think you can get that thing up to four miles an hour and on a paddling kayak. Um, gotcha. Without current, you're saying? Without current, just flat water. Like just flat water. Yeah, when I was paddling, my, my, the ascend that I used to have would do around three miles an hour with the motor. And I am convinced I could paddle that old town faster than my motor would push my ascend. Uh, <laughs> But it's stable. Like you could take you could take a step forward on it. You can stand up on it, no problems at all. And it is, if if you're looking for a budget kayak in that, like I said, that dollar range, that seven hundred to a thousand dollar range, the Topwater One Hundred and Twenty is probably the number one kayak you should be looking at. A couple others that are going to fall in that range for used are the some of the bona fides, like the RS Eleven Seven, or the um, what's the other two? The 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 kind of a 127, the original, I think. Yeah, it's like a 127. And then a 107, maybe. 107. It's not RS, but I forget what it, what is the SS. Uh, yeah, the SS. 127 and 107. I think you could finally find those in kind of that similar. Probably not 700 dollars on those, but a thousand to maybe 1300 dollars. You might be able to find some of those bona fides. And then for a new kayak, um, uh, the it's still amazing that it sells like this, but it's not going to be a kayak that works for everyone because it is a river kayak and um, it, uh, it it's it's not going to have a ton of initial stability. I'm, I've never been in one, but I, it's Drew Gregory's kayak that the Sholey. Sholey. and that thing retails at a thousand. If I don't think I'm mistaken in saying that thing retails at a thousand dollars. I think it's more like fifteen hundred for the the for the Crescent one or so okay. Crescent for the Sholey one. He's got a okay. couple of other models, I think, uh, in that that crescent line that are that are lower though. I got okay, an yeah. ultralight, the the ten footer, uh, and it's I'm I'm not the biggest guy. Uh, I'd uh, anybody much bigger than me, uh, you, you can't stand in it. I mean, yeah. I, I've stood in it, but it's <laughs> it it's it's a little sketchy. Like you yeah. you don't want to lean very much. You better better have a good base, and it's. You know, I've stood in kayaks for a long time, so I'm I'm pretty comfortable that I got decent balance. Yeah. But that that's you know, if, if you're six foot, you're gonna have a tough time standing in that thing. Yeah, I uh, said but it, it's I a did. great paddling. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I said I did say that wrong. I looked them up here. They are sixteen hundred dollars new. Some of the other crescent kayaks come in around a thousand dollars, brand new. Um, They've and got a venture, a CK one, I think, mm-hmm. um, and then the ultralight. I like. I mean, I. I didn't, I guess, technically take your advice because you hadn't given it to me yet. But, but I got a discounted. Uh, it was a color color model that they were getting rid of, and it's, it's, it's not the coolest looking. It's like a what do they call it? Dart or something like a. It's like a lime green. It looks like a cheap kayak to me. And that initially, I was like, ah, you know, I don't want the ugly kayak. I'll pay a little more for the, you know, one of the cool colors. Then I started thinking, but I was like, man, if I'm practicing for a tournament somewhere. Or, you know, I could take that thing and just look like somebody just in a recreational kayak paddling around and nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> nobody knows what you're doing. It's it's a little lightweight kayak. And, and it's definitely for, for me, it's it's kind of my creep boat. Um, you're you're but, gonna have Drew trying to come back on this show and defend the the, 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 the <laughs> We're not bashing the crest the kayak. No, no, no. They I just I, they, they I just, love that boat for what it for what it does. It's it just, uh, it's, a, it's a kayak that simply will not work for everybody. Um and that's just that's just how it's made, and it's going to work great for some people, and it just won't work for other people, um, depending but on what if, you're looking for in a kayak. If you're looking, I think I paid seven hundred, you know, brand new kayak. I think, it, and I think that I want to say they were eight hundred, so mm-hmm. less than a thousand dollars. I want to say it has, I can't remember if it has the rod holders on it or if I added, but I mean, it, it it's not gigantic. You don't have a ton of storage, but if you're looking just for something that paddles really well. That you want to get out there on a pond, um, that you want to take on a small creek, like mm-hmm. it's perfect. It's mm-hmm. it's it's going to perform a lot better than something that you're, you know, a two hundred dollar, three hundred dollar kayak at, at Walmart. It's going to be a lot more comfortable. It's got a nice seat in it. Like it's something that where you you, know, you pay a little bit more, but but I think what you get is is worth it, and you're still well below that that thousand dollar price point. Uh, I see those occasionally on on Facebook Marketplace too. Um, that that's one that I've actually got some experience in that I could recommend. Mm-hmm. I like how those those paddle, uh, mm-hmm. and if it's you know for your first one, it's it's not something I'm going to recommend if you're going to go fish a big lake 
you know, with a bunch of fast boats running around, jet skis, and, and you're going to be dealing with wake. Um, you know, it's not going to be the fastest paddling necessarily. Um, but for something to get you off the bank, kind of like we were talking earlier, you know, it it's not a bad starter boat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, that's and that's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about something that um, is is kind of that that like like I said, a, a good product for a great price. And you're you're going to be limited in what you can get. You're not going to be in a Hobie. You're not going to be in a, a an autopilot. You know, for for a budget kayak. It's unless you know. Again, there's going to be somebody that goes. I got an autopilot for eight hundred dollars. That's not. That's that's you only your story. you're the only one that gets to tell that story. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, most of the time, what what I'm talking or what I'm talking about here is most of the time these are the kayaks you're going to find kind of in that price range that are going to are going to keep you on a budget and yet get you out on the water. And then, like I said, if you do want to motorize these kayaks and you have either a little bit of um, hands-on skills or you have a, a buddy that's a shade tree mechanic that can do some electrical work for you and stuff like that, you can motorize these kayaks for, and, and not just motorize them, but you motorize them with foot control steering for anymore. I mean, with that, what the lifetime price is now for that, that lithium battery for, should be under five hundred dollars that you can motorize one of these kayaks. Um, if you get, uh, let's see, um, Newport Vessels makes a steering wing, and I don't want to say the prices on these because I don't recall and I don't want to say I'm wrong. But these are, I'm pretty sure they're all a hundred dollars or less on these, some of these products. Um, so Newport Vessels makes a steering wing. Wilderness Systems makes a uh, a motor mount for a trolling motor. Um, you can use a cutting board, um, like a half inch thick. Uh, cutting board. Uh, I forget if it'd be EVA plastic or whatever it is, but it's that plastic. You can't break it. You can cut it with like a skill saw. Uh, if you template the back of your kayak, use stainless steel bolts, you can make a mounting surface on the back of most kayaks. Um, put that wilderness systems, and I'm saying the wilderness system one because I know it's it's out there and it's, it's readily available and it would work. There's probably mm -hmm. a couple others that I don't, I'm not as familiar with or don't know about. You can mount that on top of that cutting board Put your trolling motor on there, put the new port wing on the on the shaft of the trolling motor, mount the head of the trolling motor up by your seat and run the wires through the hull. Put a put a, a, a cheap Amazon battery on it. Again, I'm gonna recommend the lie time because that's what I have experience with. I, there's a couple other brands that are gonna be just as good. In fact, if you want to do your own research, there's a guy on YouTube that tears apart these cheap Amazon batteries. And will actually tell you if they're any good or not. And he does the chins, the the uh, power queen or whatever it is, the lie time ones, some of these regular ones that you see on Amazon. And he tears them apart and tells you if they're any good or not. I don't know, recall what his name is, but he's he's on YouTube there. I, and, had, I had to show this picture again. Yeah. Your, <laughs> so, your throttle is is yep. awesome. Uh, the <laughs> so down below there, that white piece, that's a piece of PVC. Um, it's like threaded PVC. And then on the inside of the kayak, I put a ring on and that's how I tighten that PVC there. And then I, I got another piece of, I forget what it's a, it's a piece of pipe. It's not the PVC pipe, but it's another piece of pipe that I found out if I took a little bit of sandpaper to and file it down a little bit, the shaft of a trolling motor will, will fit snugly over top of that, over top of that other piece of pipe. Um, uh, I want to maybe PEX pipe. I think it might have been PEX pipe. It's like the flexible white plumbing pipe. And so if you if you shave a little bit of, of that down, the, the shaft of the trolling motor will fit over top of it. And that PEX pipe will fit into like a inch or inch and a quarter, whatever PVC coupling. Um, the mm -hmm. other thing is, and you can't see it here on these pictures, I left enough wiring because I, I have to store my kayaks outside, but I left enough wiring in the hall that the, the shaft of that trolling motor head pulls off of the PVC and I could store it in the hatch of the kayak so that I could keep the, the mm. head out, out of the weather. Um, nice. I would, I would put the battery behind my seat and just uh, actually I would put it behind that crate there. That crate's actually a DIY crate as well that has two layers on it. I was um, just noticing that. That's, <laughs> that's almost a separate tip. Like that was when I first started. I mean, the black bags are awesome. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I have one but now. If, if you don't have a hundred bucks, one hundred fifty bucks to spend on like the the fancy, the the fancy black pack with all of mm -hmm. the, 
you know, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like all the customization mm -hmm. options. Like you can get uh, a $10 milk crate. Uh, you can get a couple of like saltwater rod holders and just screw yeah. them into that and have a, <laughs> a very functional uh, rod holder. My and, rod holders there are, are, my rod holders are um, like, uh, I forget what it's called, but like drainage faucet pipes that you can mm. get for like $1.50 at a hardware store. And they're zip tied to that crate. And that, that was my rod holders. And then that crate, it was an oversized milk crate. And I, I want to add this. So Yak Attack just came out with that stackable um, piece for the top of the black pack. Mm -hmm. I forget what they're calling it. Are they calling it a sub, not a, a some kind of stack something? I forget what they're calling yeah, it. I should remember, but I don't. I, I'll just tell you, to Yak Attack, I was doing it first. <laughs> <laughs> Because because I had that on my kayak to where I had I had a, a second level that I could keep soft plastics in or uh, my my string in or my my like my fishing line and stuff I could keep all that stuff in that second layer so I was doing it first before Yak Attack ever created that thing um, but I don't I don't I don't get any royalties or anything <laughs> Yak Attack doesn't recognize me so whatever that's what do you about. what um, do you figure the uh... $25, $20 into that milk crate with all of the, the accessories on it. Yeah, something Just like ballpark. that. Yeah, 20, so on, the back, on the back of it, and you can't really see the back of it. I actually went on Amazon and I bought plastic hinges. So most people just use zip ties if they want to put a lid on their, on their crates. Mm -hmm. I actually had plastic hinges on the back of it. So that it would That's just awesome. be a little better. Like it, it's just a little better than what, what most people are having. It's a little bit yeah. more unique. Um, on the front, you see those bungees there. What you can't see behind the seat is that each one of those stacks has a, um, like a, uh, I got it at a hardware store, but like a drawer, a drawer knob on it. So the bungee loops up over top of the drawer knob and keeps, keeps everything from, you know, flipping open if I, you know, yeah, whatever. Gotcha. Uh, that and, hinge uh, so idea. Yeah, I, even that was DIY. <laughs> I'm circling back to that hinge idea because I remember the original black pack that I, which I still have. Yeah. Um, it didn't even have that. It had the, uh, like like a bungee, and you you just yeah. sort of set it up, set it down. Yeah. Like your your DIY had a, a feature that my <laughs> my expensive one did not. Yeah. Um, so cool. about this kayak now, uh, the one thing we didn't talk about is. I la even last year when I started tournament fishing, I was still running this kayak. Hmm. And this kayak, I, I fished all the tournaments out of this thing, and I fished a Bassmaster event, a bass one of the Bassmaster Opens on the Susquehanna out of this kayak. And when we're talking, you can do you can do all this stuff with DIY gear or you know cheap gear. I placed toot my own horn here i placed 12th out of 146 anglers in that bassmaster susquehanna event and i cashed it i cashed a check in a bassmaster event out of that kayak that that is awesome i will <laughs> not i don't remember exactly where i finished but it was terrible i was i was towards the bottom of the standings and i guarantee you the kayak that i was in uh i don't know uh, conservative mess at five thousand dollars between the, the kayak itself and some of the upgrades. I mean, easily five, mm -hmm. uh, more than double what yeah. yours was. <laughs> and and, and again, you, like, you kicked my butt. <laughs> one event, if we would fish more, we would have to see what happened. But um, if, so the thing is, here's the thing about this is when I, when, when I was using that kayak on the Susquehanna, I had the motor on it, but I could not go up river. I, I could go up river in short areas. You know, if I was working an island, I could work to the top of that island and kind of fish around and work up river. But if I left an area and went a quarter mile, even an eighth mile down river, I was not going to get back up to that spot. I, I wasn't going to be able to go, oh, I wish I would fish, had fished that spot more. I'm going to go back there and see if that area reloaded. Once I left it, I was gone. So I had about both days of that Bass Master event. I had three, about three miles that I covered. Um, on a float trip and I could kind of hold my areas and move up a little bit, but I was continually fishing downstream, you know, going down river and fishing where different areas in this three mile stretch. And what I did in practice, I actually covered 
So on Friday of that event, I went out and I covered 10 miles. And out of that 10 miles, I was able to reduce that down to three miles that I actually wanted to fish for the tournament. And the reason I say that is when you're fishing this budget gear, um, you can't do the things that the some of the other people are doing out of their more expensive gear. Um, I, when I launched, the second day when I launched, I was I actually... Mike Anelli, uh, Mike Aganelli launched from the same from the same ramp that I was using on day two, and he's out there in his PA fourteen Torquedo. It, I mean, just the ultimate kayak build. Um, and that's not a knock on his build or anything. He's got a <laughs> that's, that's an amazing kayak that he runs. Um, but I'm I can't do everything that Mike Anelli could do. So the only thing that I could the only the I shouldn't say the only thing I could do the the one thing you can do. If you're fishing these, you know, if you want to competitively fish on a budget, is you have got to increase your knowledge. Um, you, you've, you've, I don't know how else to say it, but you, you've got to do your homework, you know, prior to events. Um, you've got to learn what largemouth or what smallmouth or largemouth bass do, whatever you're fishing for. You got to learn what they do in different conditions. And I am not in any way, shape, or form extremely knowledgeable on this stuff. I'm, I'm always trying to increase my knowledge on these things. But, you know, there's a lot of things that I still don't know. And once you know everything about a bass, they're going to pull something funky and not do the things that they're supposed to do. Yeah. But I, if you there's your knowledge. Sorry, I'm going to cut you off. There, there's nobody that's in it. I'm trying to think how to word it. It's like nobody knows everything. Like there's yeah. there's always room to grow. That's one of the cool things about the sport. And it, it just you're you're always, always learning. And part of me is a little bit jealous I remember when I was 12, I was watching a VHS tape on bass fishing. Um, you know, well, that that was where I got a lot of my knowledge. There was no YouTube, no internet. Like anybody who's starting today, it's like you have a huge advantage, a huge leg up. Like it, it's you're able to to progress a lot quicker um, just with something. I mean, just doing YouTube searches, uh, you can find a ton of information out. And maybe not everything is going to be great. Uh, you might get some bad intel somewhere. But there's a bunch of good information. There's a lot of good channels out there. Um, but yeah, that that knowledge is important. Mm -hmm. And that that's going to be if you're if you're fishing on a budget, that's going to be one of your equalizers, and it's it's free to do. Um, I for myself, I do lawn care, so I have a lot of time that I spend with with wearing headphones or earbuds. Uh, one of the a huge thing that I do is I listen to fishing podcasts. Um, whether it be Kayak Fishing Weekly or Serious Angler, um, the Bass U podcast. Uh, yes, there's, Bass U is there's, awesome. There's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of different podcasts out there, and I'm, I'm missing some of them. But KBN is always going to have, you know, the winners of events, and they're going to be telling you what they did and how they won an event and what they were looking for. Um, and you can't, you can't throw everything that some of these people are going to tell you that they're throwing. Like if you're fishing on a budget, you're not going to be fit throwing a $150 swim bait. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to do all these things, but what you will, what will happen is, and it happens subconsciously, but you, you will hear repeatedly these conditions. I did this, or those conditions. I did that the water clarity. I did this, the water depth. I was throwing this. And when you start to hear those things repeatedly, it'll start to stick. Um, and you're, you're going to get out there and you're going to go, oh, I've never fished this scenario before, but I know exactly what to do or what I should do in this scenario. And so for myself, I'm barely even, I would say I'm barely even a weekend warrior. Um, like I get out every weekend if I can, but I can't even get out every weekend. Um, and some of these guys that are in tournaments, they're getting out two, three times a week. Um, whether, and, you know, just in the evening, a couple hours in the evening or for a full day or whatever. Um, so for myself, the equalizer that I have found is to increase my knowledge. Um, and that when I'm out there and I see something and maybe I haven't spent the time on the water and time on the water is probably the most important thing to increase your knowledge. But because I don't have the liberty to always spend that time on the water, um, the knowledge is, is, is the only thing that I can go to and it, the knowledge that I've, I've gained from just researching YouTube podcasts, um, articles, whatever I can find to, to increase my knowledge. And that way, when I get out in different conditions, I might not have the firsthand knowledge, but I, I, 
it clicks to go, oh, I should be doing this. And that that type of thing, that knowledge is free. doesn't cost a thing. So if you're on a budget and you don't have time to spend every, you know, two, three days on the water or even once a week on the water, if you're getting out, you know, two, three times a month, increasing your knowledge is going to be one of the best equalizers to be able to fish on a budget and yet to be able to compete at the highest level you're capable of doing. That's great advice. I, I remember because that was something that I did as a 12 year old kid. You know, I didn't have the ability to drive myself, you know, wherever I wanted to go to fish. I uh, didn't have, uh, you know, all of the, the latest and greatest gear, you know, maybe one or two rides and a couple of different baits. Um, but I would scour. I mean, I, I would go through every Bassmaster magazine at the library uh, mm -hmm. until I eventually was subscribing myself. I was I was reading outdoor life, every like bit of information I could consume, you know, 20 and 30 year old fishing related books, you know, that I could find at the library. Um, and it was so much fun when I finally got and you know, I did a lot of farm ponds at that age, you know, fishing farm ponds with soft plastics. That was kind of what I did. Um, and when I got into different situations, when I was a little older and I was in college, I had access to a river, different scenarios. And, and kind of like you were saying, you, you oh, I, I remember reading about this in a magazine and you actually apply it. And when it works, like when you actually see that works, like your confidence yeah. It, it's such an awesome feeling like you you've you've I've read about this scenario for years. I don't know that I ever caught a fish on a something like Kazara spook before. And then you go and, and throw that in that river and, you know, big small mouth comes up and eats it. And it's just yeah. like that feeling is awesome when you actually get to apply that that knowledge that you think you've sort of been building. Yeah, I, I, I I'll give a free plug on this one. If the best, this is probably the best source to increase your knowledge, and it's going to be especially on river fishing, and he doesn't hold anything back. He gives you all the knowledge that he knows. If you want to go on YouTube and learn probably the most you can from one single channel, that's going to be Jeff Little. Without he does doubt. not hold anything back when it comes to knowledge, and I've learned so much from him just watching his stuff. And now, granted, he's on the Susquehanna. I go out and fish the Susquehanna, but, you know, he'll be talk about, you know, these eddies with the foam bubbles on top and stuff. And you might've never seen that in your life. And you, you listen to this stuff and you get on, on the Susquehanna or any other river, you're going to see a foam eddy or you're going to see an eddy with foam bubbles on it. And you're going to go, I'm going to cast this little jig or a wacky rig Sanko or whatever, right into there. You're probably going to catch a small mouth. I mean, like if you, if you know, you find a couple of those eddies, one of those eddies is going to be holding small mouth and you're going to catch one. You're going to, I never did that before, but I heard Jeff Little talk about it and I just made that happen. And it's freaking awesome. Um, He's, he was <laughs> his and Chad Hoover's. Those were the two channels. Um, you know, when I, the, the first ones that I saw on YouTube and mm -hmm. I, I credit them with getting me into kayak fishing. I didn't know either of them at the time, but mm -hmm. watching their videos got me out of my little Bass Pro Shops, Bron Power pond prowler and into a kayak and uh, they've been putting out content for mm -hmm. like 15 years now mm -hmm. something something like that i mean it, it's and like you said you know jeff does not hold back it is <laughs> uh it is just I, I feel like he's got one of the most underrated channels like his his following should be massive for what mm -hmm. he's giving everybody like if anybody out there deserves a follow <laughs> go follow jeff little on yes YouTube. <laughs> yes Along with that, like when I, so a couple years ago when I got back into fishing and when I got into kayak fishing, like I was green on fishing. Yeah, I grew up, you know, throwing Senkos into a, into a lake and catching bass, but I was green on, on fishing and especially on kayak fishing. And at that time when I was getting into it, like I had all these questions like, you know, like what's, what's a medium action rod versus a medium heavy or what's a heavy action rod and when should I be using a heavier action rod and what kind of line should I put on it? And what's the difference between monofilament and braid and fluorocarbon? And like, I didn't know all these questions. And if you're new to kayak fishing, if you're a newer newcomer to fishing and you're trying to do it on a budget, you're going to have all these questions. And that was a couple of years ago. I can't imagine if you're a newcomer now and you're coming into the scene and all you're hearing is forward facing sonar this and mega live that and mega 360 and torpedoes and new ports. And you're hearing all this things that weren't even the things that I was hearing just a couple of years ago, getting into it. You're quickly going to be like, 
wait, and it costs how much? It costs two thousand dollars for this, and two thousand dollars for that, and two, you know, and a kayak is four thousand dollars, and like you're quickly going to become overwhelmed. And the reason we all get into this is because it's cheaper than the alternative of a bass boat competition. Exactly. And you're quickly going to be like, man, like I, I don't, I can't even afford this, and it's not true. Like, yes, you, all those things have their place and people use them and they they people win tournaments with them but if you i mean just look at this last bassmaster championship like was i, I don't i don't know was drew gregory you, you talked to him was he running a graph at all when he went up that river i don't, I don't think, so. think he was I don't think he had one on the kayak i don't remember seeing he, one of the pictures yes he had a torquedo um but i mean he was fishing pretty bare bones other than a motor um yep and out of a out of an inexpensive kayak, you know, sixteen hundred dollar brand new kayak. But compared to the other people in that competition, he was running an inexpensive kayak. The, the the whole idea that you can't do this unless you're keeping up with the Joneses in this sport is just not true. Um, do they? Does it give you an edge? Yes, but that's why we were saying if you have the knowledge, that can be your edge if you're trying to do this thing on a budget. Um, and. I, I'll give you here's your clippable here's your clippable moment, Justin. Um, <laughs> and this is going to be a hot take. Wait on me. You're going to like it, but if you're in if you're if you're in tournaments, if you're fishing tournaments, and you are consistently finishing in the bottom half of of, tor- of the tournaments, and maybe not every time, consistently in the bottom fifty percent, getting forward facing sonar is not going to put you in the top half because you sh- you can finish in the top half like repeatedly without running any technology if you have knowledge of fish a lot of these times these 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 especially the local tournaments you're going to have like two or three maybe four hammers in that tournament and then after that it's a crapshoot like anyone can finish in in a top five spot on a lot of these local tournaments at least from what i've seen and i haven't been all around the country but from what from what from what i've seen in my area and getting forward-facing sonar when you were not previously finishing well is not going to win you tournaments. You, you don't need forward-facing sonar. You need to increase your knowledge of bass. And then once you increase your knowledge of bass, forward-facing sonar will play a part in, in you doing better in tournaments or, or winning tournaments. But if you're not finishing well in tournaments, grabbing forward-facing sonar, getting a torpedo, getting a Newport is not going to change where you're finishing. Because what you need to do is increase your knowledge of fish. Yeah, the basics, the understanding bass behavior, uh, Mm -hmm. improving mechanics, getting to where you can put your bait in places where the average angler can't. You're casting accurate. You're not slamming Mm -hmm. your your bait into the dock on the first cast and and spooking (laughs) everything. Like that that sort of stuff um, is going to go a lot further than you know than you just pouring a bunch of money into into technology. And I say that, I know that's a hot take. You're going to look at, you can go and look at my Torny X stats and you're going to be like, well, you didn't finish well in these tournaments. And yeah, I haven't always finished well in tournaments, but at the same time, if we're talking about, does. Yeah. If we're talking about, see, except for Russ Snyder, (laughs) is that what you said? Yeah. (laughs) Russ, Drew, they're, they're pretty consistent. I mean, there's other guys, but yeah, but yeah, most of us, most of us mortals know. Yeah. Increasing your knowledge of fishing is going to be what moves you up a leaderboard not getting the latest greatest technology and if you're already if you're not already moving up the leaderboard the technology is not going to be what moves you up the leaderboard and and, and, and we're talking competitive fishing but in, in a competitive fishing that technology and that if, if you have the money for it and you want to get forward facing sonar because you think it, it's cool to play video games on the water and that's what you want to do then and i'm not saying that's a knock but because I, I i don't have it but i can see where it'd be fun and that's what you want to do then go spend the money on it but now you're not in the budget fishing realm anymore yeah. if, you, if you have that no it's good stuff and I, I i feel like we've run long i've kept you long but i i do want to go over a couple of things maybe like rapid fire or semi rapid yeah. fire we talked we talked to kayaks a couple a couple of budget options um and the, the tackle I, I there's there's so much tackle out there it's like if I was going to simplify it and say, "Hey, I'm I'm new to this sport. What should I buy if I want to want to get bites, catch fish?" For me, I would say just generally, if you stay in the realm of soft plastics, you're going to get a lot of bites. Soft plastics have caught fish for forever. They're relatively expensive. You can pay a couple bucks, you get a pack of 
know, depending on the brand, pack of 10, 15, 20, whatever baits, um, you know, that, that is where I would go. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that as far as, as bait? So let's do this. I'm going to, I'm just going to mention some name brands and some models of different items that will allow you to fish on a budget and yet fish decent quality stuff. And I, if, if you're, if you're cool with that, I'm just going to name some stuff. And people are going to have, if, if you want to write this stuff down, you're going to have to pause this podcast, write it down and then keep listening. And that's fine. Um, for, for a Senko, like Yamamoto, um, Yamamoto, what I don't know, whatever the pronunciation on that is probably the best Senko. But a pack of eight or 10 of those cost the same amount as a Yum Dinger 30 pack. And the Yum Dinger 30 pack is still going to catch you fish. And it's in, in probably a lot of conditions, it's probably going to catch pretty much the same amount of fish that the Yamamoto Senkos will. And you're going to pay about the same price for a 30 pack that you pay for a 10 pack. Um, so right there is one, if you want to throw a jig and I threw this jig for, for, for a couple years until I started, you know, branching out in the jigs, um, the Strike King Bitsy Bug, and there's two of them. It's like the Bitsy Bug and the Bitsy Bug Flip. flip. They're pretty much the same thing. I think one has a more stout hook. Uh, yeah, flip, in, Flip's got a bigger hook. I think they come, some of those come in anywhere from a quarter ounce, probably even less up. I think they come in an eighth ounce, even up to about, I think maybe a half ounce. Um, I know they come in three eighths. I don't know a hundred percent. They come in half ounce and that is just a do everything jig. Like it's a do everything jig. Like you can flip it, you can, um, drag it, you can use it like a football jig. Um, that's going to be, if, if you want a cheap jig that you can do everything, that bitsy bug is going to be, going to be your best shot. And that's, that's what I called a, my PB largemouth on, um, was a, was a bitsy bug. Um, the uh, uh, let's see, I, I, we can't go through all the stuff, but on some of this stuff, like um, spinner, spinner baits, um, chatter baits, stuff like that, find one and buy one and, and just keep that one. Now, if you want to buy something else, try something else, that's fine, but you know, jackhammer is the best, right? But an original chatter bait, which is like less than half the price of a jackhammer is is still going to catch you fish. You know, you're going to hear these pros talk about, oh, I was using a jackhammer and that's all they use. And I use jackhammers and they're great. But an original chatterbait is still going to catch you a lot of fish. That um, Evo is a good in between. I think it's, yeah. I want to say it's 10 bucks instead of 15, 16, whatever the, the jackhammers are running now. And it's, I can't tell the difference in the vibration. I have one. I haven't thrown it yet. But I, I do have one of those Evos. I just haven't had an opportunity to throw yet. The water's still so cold here in PA. Is it? Um, I was out this past weekend, and we were still at like forty-eight. Um, like it's it's it's. I'm sorry. It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, um, but yeah, there's a lot of gear out there where if and let's just say it this way about some of these baits that we don't have to go through all these baits, but like that Bitsy bug, find a bait that can do multiple things. Um, that Bitsy book, like I said, you could you could use it as a swim bait. I mean, not a swim bait, as a swim jig. You could use the Bitsy bug as a swim jig. You could use it as a football jig. You could use it as a flipping jig. Um, find, find those things that you have multiple uses. And then with a couple different trailers or a little bit different weight on it, um, you could use it for multiple applications. And that, that, that stands true for all tackle. Um, I like it for, for a jig or for a Sanko or whatever. Um, we, we talked kayaks. We've talked, you know, generally baits, um, paddles. Another one that I don't know if I want to admit this. I bought who makes it. I think it's Warner. I want to say it's a Calist or Caliste mm -hmm. many years ago uh, when I had a very good job, I, I paid over $500 for a paddle. <laughs> and it was an awesome paddle. I loved it. I used it for a long time. Uh, and then I, I spray painted it camo and uh, left it on the side of the boat ramp and went back a couple hours later <laughs> and it had walked off. Um, but if, especially if you're new, I feel like a paddle is one of those places that you should not spend a bunch of money. Um, if you're going to be paddle on the kayak, uh, yes, once you get some experience, you will notice a difference as you go up in price with a kayak paddle. Uh, but I think bending branches, I can't remember the model, but bending branches makes 
uh, a paddle that's in the $60 range. Um, and I, I have ha have used even cheaper paddles than that. I remember wading in the Shenandoah River. I paddled up river, got to an area that I'm fishing. Uh, and then probably the last hour before dusk, I'm waiting. And at some point, bump the kayak paddle. And it, it, I don't remember which model I had at that point. It was a nice paddle, you know, high-end kayak paddle. Bumped it, didn't have it tethered. It, it floats down river. I got no idea where it is. I realize it, you know, about dusk. So I end up having to make a trip into Walmart. I just need something, a paddle to get me back downstream. I think I paid twenty dollars, maybe thirty dollars. I don't even remember the brand of the kayak, or excuse me, on the paddle. Um, but I used that for probably six months. Like it was serviceable. I used it, and I didn't notice that much of a difference between the one that I was using. Now, again, I'm not. I'm not saying that you know if you go out and get a high end paddle that there's no difference. There definitely is. Uh, but it, it's an area where, to me, that's one of the, an area where you should save money. Uh, what have you got any any particular paddle uh, that you like starting out, or, or what are your thoughts on on paddles? So I don't have strong opinions on paddles, and I'll tell you why is because when I when I started kayak fishing, I just wanted something cheap, and so I bought one of those field and stream shoot paddles or whatever they are. They're like forty bucks, fifty bucks, something like that. And I used that paddle for all the time that I was pad paddling. Uh, and then when I started motorizing my kayaks, I didn't care what kind of paddle I had because I use it, you know, you're going to use it uh, for launching and when, maybe when you're coming in and maybe if you get into some rapids. And now like that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a good paddle because if you get into some really crazy rapids, a good paddle is probably going to really help you out. Um, but most of the paddles that I like I had the field and stream and now on my Kusa X, I have, I think it's actually a Pelican paddle. I think that one might've been 80 or $90 or something like that. And the one main reason I got it was because it matched the color coding of my kayak. <laughs> and <Nice>. uh, <laughs> so that that's, I don't have a strong opinion on a paddle, but a, if we're talking budget, a $50 field and stream paddle will get you around. And if you want to keep your price down, you can do it with a $50 paddle. Yep. I, uh, I agree completely. Well, shoot, I'm trying to think, glance at the notes, trying to see if there's anything else I wanted to cover. I think we've hit the major points. Um, anything can, can, that... we, can we talk rods a little bit? Because that's where yeah. you're really about budget stuff. Let's, let's, do you, I mean, I know we're almost on an hour and a half. I'll try and keep it quick, but my yeah, let's, not let's, specific, let's, let's talk, talk rods. A little bit because that's going to be really where you budget things. Um, I'm going to quickly fire off a couple name brands of rods and then reels that you can use that are, like we said, that original definition, a, a good product at a great price. Um, Luz has a couple rods. Luz has rods anywhere from the cheapest rods up to more expensive, higher dollar rods. But there's a couple, there's a couple rods um, that Luz makes that I've used, and I can tell you they, they, they work. Um, the one is a Walmart Luz rod, and it's it's the neon green Luz Laser HS, and it sells for right around thirty dollars. I have played using using that rod. Um, it wasn't the only rod I used. But using that rod, uh, the first tournament that I ran this past year with Slay Nation, um, we are actually even though we're Slay Nation PA, we were fishing this tournament in in New Jersey because of the. Um, the legal like you can't bed fish for bass in pa but you can in new jersey and it was over the spawn gotcha. that 30 dollar rod was what i used to bed fish because I, I i use that rod for little swim baits and that rod cashed me a check in the first tournament that i fished in the slay nation i came in fourth place using a 30 dollar rod with a abu Gar an older abu garcia silver max which is basically a black max um uh, another another rod that Luz makes is actually here. Let's do this. I have I have that green rod right here. Um, you'll recognize it because you see you'll see them at Walmart, and that's the Silver Max on it. Right now, I've got a crankbait on it. It's not the perfect rod for a crankbait because it's not it's got a faster action, but it works. Um, another Luz rod. You can find it here. You know what? I don't think I brought it back here. Um, but another another good lose rod, and this is probably one of the 
best rods you can buy at a cheap price is the Luz SG1 rod. Um, it is $59.99, so it's $60. And the cool thing about this rod is you could have an entire rod arsenal with just Luz SG1s. Um, they make those SG1 lines, they come anywhere. I want to say they start at medium light on the spinning reels, um, all the way up to medium heavy on, or I said spinning reels, spinning rods, all the way up to medium heavy on the spinning rods. And on the um, casting rods, they start at, I actually don't remember if they have mediums on their casting rods, but medium heavies all the way up to the heavy. Um, I don't have a dedicated swim bait rod yet, but I'm about to buy one. And when I buy one, it's going to be the Luz SG-1. It's a $60 rod. I'm going to use it for, for swim baits. They make a, it's a seven foot four um, heavy action or heavy, moderate, moderate, or sorry, moderate fast. So it's going to be a perfect swim bait rod. Uh, and it, it will throw up to two ounces. So you can throw mag drafts on it. You can throw chat, uh, chad shads on it. You know, your, your bigger glides. Um, is it perfect? No. Is it a good rod at a great price? Yes. And and when I go to get a dedicated swim bait rod, unless there's some crazy deal on something else, I'm going to be getting one of those loose SG-1 rods. Um, my real price. Ticket, pardon? You can't beat that price. $60. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that... Sometimes you'll find on these cheaper rods, they have stainless steel eyelets because that's one way, or like the stainless steel guides, because that's one way they keep the price down. That one does not have stainless steel guides. That one has, it's not, I don't think it's Fuji guides, but it's, it's got good guides on it. Um, like the ceramic or whatever, or whatever the different materials are, but it's got good guides on it. Um, gotcha. And, and, that that's going to be the rod that I buy for my swim bait rod, unless, like I said, they're running some kind of crazy deal on some other type of rod that's a that's better. Um, the one thing I probably will do with that that won't be so much budget is I'm going to end up spending a little bit more on my my bait caster on that one because I want a bigger, beefier bait caster that can handle the the heavier line and the excuse me the heavier um, swim baits that I'm going to be throwing with that one. So that one I'm going to break the whole budgeting thing a little bit by buying a, a more expensive bait caster. But even with that, if I can find one on Facebook Marketplace for half the price of retail, I'm going to try and do that. Um, <clears throat> another great casting rod if for swim baits, jerk baits, things like that, are these right here. These are the Falcon HD rods. Um, you can get these on Tackle Warehouse, probably other places too. Um, but Falcon HD rods. And they are eighty dollars. And this one right here is a six foot eight, uh, medium, um, moderate fast. And it's pretty flimsy. It's probably more like a moderate. Throw jerk baits, crank baits, anything like that on it. Um, because it's got it's got nice parabolic bend on it. Um, and all these rods, I do a lot of creek fishing. All these rods, I have absolutely bent them out of shape getting under some low limbs and things like that to the point where I was like, well, that one's going to break and they haven't broken so far. So I, I would attest that they're pretty good quality. Um, let me show you two of the rods that I like the best for a, a decent price. And these are a little bit more expensive. This is the Dobbins Colt. Um, this one I want to say is $80. Um, and they have, you, again, you could do most of your line in the Dobbins Colt rods. Um, this one is a medium, heavy, moderate, fast. Um, I throw top water on it. I'll throw, uh, spinner baits, chatter baits, um, uh, lipless crank baits, um, anything like that. B bigger, um, bigger crank baits you can throw on this one, but they have a whole line on these. And then also the Dobbins Maverick, um, which is. This is a $99.99 rod, so it's basically a $100, um, $100 rod. It's definitely on that upper end of what you might call budget rods. It's, it's probably out of some people's budget for budget gear. But when you're talking good, uh, good rod, like really good rods that you want to keep the price under $100, these Dobbin Mavericks are, are a really great rod to do that with. And again, they have pretty much a full line on these rods that you can 
um, give about any presentation. A lot of the reels, so all my spinning reels are the Daiwa Legalis. Um, it's the Legalis L, uh, not LT. Yeah, I think it is LT 2500. These, when I first bought these, I think they were around $60. Now, I don't know why, but apparently Daiwa figured out that these are worth more than $60 and now they're retailing for more around $80. Um, <laughs> but it's a great spinning reel. Um, they also, Daiwa also makes the, there's a couple different uh, models that they make that are in that budget range. The Regal, I've heard great things about the Regal. I think it's pretty similar to the Legalis. That one's going to be more around $60. Um, there's, I mean, this is all this is all gear that I use in competition from the cheapest lose rod that I showed you up to up to these a little bit more expensive, but what I would still consider budget rod and reels. And the, these are what I'm using to fish either at local tournaments or even the national level tournaments that when they come through the area and I can I can't travel around the country. I wish I could. But, you know, when they come close enough and I want to fish one of these national level events, this is this is the equipment I'm using. And you can you can use this equipment at the highest level and have success with them. That um, last um, Dobbins rod you mentioned, um, I'm familiar with the Fury series. Uh, I had a couple of their, their swim bait rods. Um, how, how does that compare? Is it is it uh, like one or half step down? Uh, so in I don't, terms I've, of never, price? I've never used a Fury. So originally, okay. I, if I, I think I heard whether it was the, the head guy of Dobbins his last name is Dobbin, right? It's not yeah, it's Gary. Not, I think Gary, Gary Dobbins. Dobbins. I think I forget if I heard him talking or somebody saying this is what Gary Dobbins said or something like that. But that you know, a couple of years ago, that Fury line was their economy budget line. Now that Fury line is now at more around 120. I don't want to say it's 130. I should have looked it up, but it, it's it's moved up a little bit. And gotcha. they came out they came out with the Colt and the Maverick line to kind of fill that economy line in with something again. Um, gotcha. And so I don't know how it compares other than that it was created to fill the void when the price of the Fury increased. Okay. Um, and so again, you're getting a Dobbins rod with the Dobbins warranty um, for under a hundred dollars with that Colton Maverick series. And if you keep your eyes peeled, that Maverick series, when I bought at least one of the, one of the Maverick rods that I have, it was on sale and I bought it at cheaper than what the cult was selling for because of the sale that, that I was able to buy it on. Um, do we have time for a quick story on, on rods? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think I know the one you're going to, you're okay. going to tell. So one of the rods. So when I first started, like when I really first started fit, like in the kayak fishing, I was using ugly sticks GX twos, which, they're like $40, $50 and they're serviceable. They're not great. They're not, I'd, I'd struggle to call them good. Other than that, you're not going to break them. Like if you're worried about breaking your rod, get a, get a ugly stick GX2 because um, you won't break it. And I was using some ugly sticks and some rods like that. And one of my buddies that um, he had this rod, it was an Abu Garcia spinning rod, a uh, villain 2.0, which you can't really find them anymore. There might be a couple floating around on eBay. And he had broken off the last couple, like three, four inches, whatever, of this rod. And it was broken down to the second to the second guide. And he knew I was using these ugly sticks. And he was like, here, use this rod. It's a quality rod. It's just the tips broken on it. And I thought for a while about putting a new guide on the end, like an actual end guide on it. But I started fishing this thing just from the second eyelid. And I was amazed because, you know, quality rod, I could now feel the bottom. I could feel everything I was doing with it versus these ugly sticks that I was originally running. Right. And um, I think I had a Fluger President on it, which again, great reel. I don't have any back here, but a Fluger President is another good budget reel, um, spinning reel that you can get. That rod, for whatever reason, had mojo. And with that rod, I caught my PB smallmouth, which was a 21-inch, 5-pound, 6-ounce smallmouth up on the Juniana. I And then the next year, I caught my PB largemouth, which was a six pound, 14 ounce, basically a seven pound largemouth out of a small creek, lo a local small creek that I like to fish. So that rod caught my, both my smallmouth and my largemouth PB. At the end of last year, I was fishing a tournament with Slay Nation. It was the championship tournament. And 
there was only a couple a handful of us fishing in that tournament because it's a late season tournament. I ended up winning that tournament. And in also with winning it, I caught big bass in that tournament. And I caught it with that broken tip rod. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I used to catch the big bass in that tournament. Later in that day, I was running in a different part of the lake and I wanted to, to put my kayak up on the bank for I forget what reason. And I left that rod hanging off the, the top end of the kayak. And when I went to get in close to the bank, I uh, that rod snagged on a reed and twisted it back and snapped that mojo rod. Oh. <laughs> and uh. so I, I, ever since then, I have not caught a new PB or even anything huge. Um, I, I'm hoping the mojo did not stop with that rod for catching big fish. <laughs> but, but the point is that rod was free. It was broken, but it was a good rod. And I had confidence in that rod because that rod would catch big fish. It's a massive fish for Pennsylvania. <laughs> for Pennsylvania. Now, I'm not superstitious. I don't think there was something magic about a rod. But the point is, if you get budget gear and you develop confidence in it and you develop knowing how to use that budget gear, you can catch anything with that budget gear. And that's that's the point I'm making here is that even a broken free rod that a buddy gave to me caught big fish and cash me checks because I'm it, I fish on a budget. <laughs> it reminds me of, I don't know if you were following the, the Bassmaster Elite Series at the time. It, it's been a few years. I, I believe it was the year that Jordan Lee won the classic on Lake Conroe. I had that massive come from behind win the last day, but he was fishing a rod and he had busted a couple of the guides out of it. was still fishing with it. <laughs> and where other guys were commenting about that, that, you know, it, we always have it in our head that we've got to have the nicest, fanciest mm -hmm. thing. And you, you ding a rod up or you've got some little blemish on, oh, we'll put that one away and pick up. He's fishing with this rod, does not care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wins, wins the, the, I mean, what I, I think most people would agree is the, the biggest tournament in, in the sport of bass fishing uh, with a, a rod that's, mm -hmm. that's got busted out guys on yeah. <laughs> So it's, and, it's, and that's uh, where Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you. you that's go ahead. confidence. Confidence, which is built off of knowledge, which is your greatest asset when you're trying to fish on a budget. You build the knowledge, and that knowledge builds confidence, and you're able to do these things on a budget. That's what brings it all together. It's it's not mojo and it's not superstition. I know I was saying that, but it's 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 the confidence that you build in your gear, and that is based that originally is based on knowledge. <clears throat> I like it. That's well put. And I think that's a, a good way to close it out. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity. Um, where can people find you? Um, I am. I don't have YouTube or anything like that. And my Facebook is my own private thing. So I'm not, I won't share sure. that. But my Instagram, my Instagram is all my fishing stuff. And that's at B Yoder Fishing. Um, I do all my stuff on there. I have my newer kayak build on there and some of the ways that I kind of went about that. And I just post, you know, content that i enjoy it's not necessarily stuff that blows up on the algorithm or anything like that but i enjoy making it so it works for me um i've got so you won't see the ascend on there anymore there there are some pictures back in it you'll see the kusa x now with that newport nk 180 everything or a lot of the stuff i did with that was on a budget as well as far as buying things on black friday sales buying things with discount codes um with points things like that to keep the price down so now i have that kusa x NK180, uh, it's got a Helix 7. Um, it's got two, I have I have two anchor wizards, one on the front and back because I wanted two anchor wizards, both for either whether I'm fishing in you know light current. Don't drop an anchor on in heavy current. Um, but if I'm Good fishing job. in light current or in eddies, or if I'm in a lake, two anchor wizards, if you're in a lake, will allow you to really lock in place um, in places that, because I don't have a power pool because the power pool is too expensive, more than I want to spend. So I've got that Cusax with all that and then a bunch of Yak Attack parts to tie it all together. I built that whole kayak. So I, I did the build myself, but more with, you know, the kits and stuff that, that you can buy, like the Yak Attack stuff. or the And, and I've got the Innovative Sportsman um, uh, foot control steering kit on it. And I built that kayak. And if, you know, I, I'm somewhere with these numbers, somewhere around here, I built that whole kayak for under $4,500, um, which is a lot cheaper than if you buy this stuff at full cost. Oh yeah. So that's a good kayak with a lot of bells and whistles at a, at a good <laughs> price. Yeah. Yeah. 
it uh brandon thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing all this uh you know i i hope you know guys watched all the way through the end and uh, it's a lot of good information and, and i think you you summed it up really well with that point about it it's knowledge it's confidence that that comes from that knowledge uh, i don't know how many times i've i've been at tournaments and seen a guy with a real simple setup paddle only kayak you know one or two rods with a couple of baits they have confidence in and they're cutting a check and they smoked me in that tournament and my fancy kayak with all my expensive gear and it uh you know it does not take you know uh, a a a super fancy expensive kayak all the latest and greatest gear it's like you can do it on a budget so okay. thank you for sharing sharing the way that you've done it uh it, it's been a lot of fun for me i enjoyed this thoroughly a lot of fun ladies and gentlemen brandon yoder we'll talk to you soon brandon thank you that that was a lot of fun for me uh bringing back a lot of memories from when i first started out um you know many many years ago first getting into fishing um and some of the things that you do to you know some of those those rod and reel combos that i paid 40 dollars for at walmart many many moons ago um but again thanks to brandon for coming on and we're we're near the end of the show uh it's it's time for kayak kings and queens of the week and i've got two for this week you know i talked about some of the the tournaments that we had uh, the hobie bos i talked about the kbf national championship uh, and I actually mentioned this this first king of the week, uh, Bennett Nell, uh, or Nall, I apologize. Um, you know, I mentioned him earlier in the show, finishing third at that Hobie BOS Open. Uh, I went back and did some research because I thought I recognized that name. I thought I recognized that face. And sure enough, he is having a heck of a 2024 season. Uh, he fishes a lot of, of the, I believe the, oh, my brain is not working. Vinny series. Oh, come on. I apologize, Vinny. Um, my, my brain is not working at the moment, but he's, he fishes a lot of the, the tournaments out of North Carolina. Um, and he's, he's fished this year, three of the, what I would consider the major series, you know, a third place finish in the, the BOS that we already mentioned. He fished the Bassmaster championship uh, on Lake 10 killer, a third place finish there. Uh, and then he also fished, the Bassmaster season over opener on Lake Murray. I, I can't remember the exact number. I want to say it was 250 guys finished 14th in that. Uh, Bennett is on a tear, a heck of an angler. Um, had to give it to him. Uh, he's our, our first king of the week. And uh, for for the second king, I wanted to recognize somebody that, that had a great tournament. Uh, also at this Hobie BOS, uh, Mr. Cody Brather. Um, Great guy. To, to me, he's one of the nicest guys in the sport. Um, I know he's he's been involved. He's helped out. Uh, he's acted as tournament director before for Hobie. Um, you know, I, I know he's also a, a professional photographer. He gets to, to go around with with some of the pros in the Bass Boats and film some of these tournaments. Uh, but Cody's a great guy. He also uh, runs the, the fellowships or, or leads and participates in a lot of the fellowship at the, the Hobie events. A great dude. And he, he finished eighth. Uh, I know he doesn't get to fish as many of these, these tournaments as he would like, but I thought it was awesome. Uh, I was really happy to see him crack the top 10, catch some big fish at the Hobie on Norman. So congrats to Cody. He's my second king of the week. And that's going to do it for this edition of Kayak Fishing Weekly. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with more kayak fishing conversation. If you have thoughts, comments, concerns, shoot us a, a message on socials. Um, and yeah, until next week, good luck out there.